but my name is Alu Bell. <laughs> I like saying Alu Bell. Alu Bell. Probably because I chose Alu Bell. Alu Bell is my stage name. Yeah, you may think it's two names. It's not, it's one name. Sting, Cher, Prince, Seal, Madonna, Alu Bell. All right, everybody. My next guest is a veteran comedian who has been on the comedy scene since the 1980s. And in 1988, he even won Star Search. He was also one of the last comedy acts to perform on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and has toured the world. And in 2013, he won the Amuse Moose Award, uh, which was the judge's prize as the best one person show in the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. His career has had many highs and lows, and his new documentary, Mentally Al, explores the atypical comedic mind of a man widely admired by his peers, if not well known to the general public. But without further ado, here he is, folks, the one and only Al Rubel, Al LaBelle. I'll say it all as one word, Al LaBelle. <laughs> How you doing, man? Thank you. So had you seen my act before, you saw it in the documentary where I, I did that? I I remember your act. I actually remember. I, I was always like a, a stand up comedy nerd, pretty much, um, my whole life. So I, I would watch Star Search like crazy. I remember your Star Search set. But I love singing. I love dancing. Except whenever I dance, I always snap my fingers. And so I was like, <laughs> and I asked myself why I snap my fingers, and my answer was to keep the beat. <laughs> like this makes sense. Like if I suddenly stop. And I, yeah, I remember um, when you won it, uh, all that stuff. The $100,000 comedy champion is Al Lubell. Uh, here, here, take your money. That's $100,000. You know, it was great when I saw this, this documentary. I was like, yeah, that's that's Al LaBelle, man. This is awesome, man. <laughs> still alive. That's funny. I remember one time, I like ten years ago, I went to an old agent. I, I used to he used to be based in New York, and I used to live in New York. I'm from New York, but I I was living in Manhattan, and I had him as an agent in the '90s. And I ended up then we I left him like in the early '90s, and then he's a good agent, but I just wasn't getting enough work. And then uh, I moved out to. LA at 2011 and I looked him up and I went out to his office and he goes gee Al I can't believe this. I th I heard that you committed suicide wow so I it's you... weird that I give off an aura of a guy that probably killed himself or something. <laughs> I hope I can this show continues I hope can you to be funny I mean I as you can tell I've been funny in the past and of course I've also not been funny in the past and, and as you can tell I've also not been funny in the present do you think it's it's easier now for for comics w once they get a, a little established like for you when you hit the tonight show level or star search if that happened nowadays like let's say you won um you know a, co a comedy contest like america's got talent or something you, c you can then parlay that into a netflix special there's all these other mediums D do you think that that makes it easier for today's comedians or is it still the same same old game well, I don't know. In some ways, easier because uh, I think, see, when I won Star Search, that was a great thing to win, but it was syndicated television. It wasn't network TV, right? It was on like Channel 11 or something in like New York or whatever, and, But which is a great thing. But still, that's why I was less nervous doing Star Search. No offense to Star Search, but, right. but I felt less pressure because I would have been really scared in 1987, 88 to do The Tonight Show. Right. Like, for that. But Star Search was only two minutes at a time. It wasn't Johnny Carson Network. It was syndicated. So I felt it was like a chance for me to practice a little. So uh, I wasn't that nervous. And maybe that's why it helped me win, maybe because I was a little less nervous. I was still nervous. I was still scared. But uh, anyway, my point is now, if you do like whatever they call America's Got Talent, that's network television, right? right. It's more viewers, I think, than Star Search may have had. So I think it's easier in some ways, especially, you know, if you win something like that, you know, to really, you know, because you're a star on network television, you know? Right on, right on. Now, I don't uh, like network television, so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even have a television. I don't watch it. No offense again, network television. I don't want to create an enemy. 
network television versus Al Lubell. You know, I, I'm afraid of enemies. I don't mind them ignoring me, but I don't. Right. So let right. me say I love network television. <laughs> to our seven prestigious panelists, I'd just like to say, who are you to judge? <laughs> the, uh, but, uh, you know, I've noticed, you know, the singing competition is a lot easier to win on Star Search than the comedy, I think, because to win the singing, all you have to do is get applause, not just at the end of the song, in the middle of the song. And to get applause, all you have to do is hit a high note. Right? Somewhere over the rainbow, there'll be a place for me. So with, uh, with Star Search, that was 88. Who... who who were some of the comics that you were up against that year? Yeah, I you know I remember one comes to mind, an excellent comedian uh, named Jeff Stilson. You know, oh yeah, Jeff? yeah, Jeff Stilson, yeah, excellent. You know, and he went on to a great uh, producing. He produces Tony, like if he produced that show. Uh, what was that show with the Oz, Ozzy, uh, the guy that bit a bat's head? Oh off? yeah, the Osbournes. He produced yeah. that. Yeah, he was the producer of that. Oh, very yeah. cool. Yeah, you know, produced a lot of, uh, you know, uh, sports programs and a great wrote for Letterman for years and a lot of shows were a great comic. So I luckily beat him and I, a uh, guy from Long Island, actually, the first, you know, the odds were against me in the first one. He had just won this guy and what's his, Frankie Pace? Oh, Frankie Pace. Yeah, he was on with you. Yeah. <laughs> he was, he, I was, I was the first guy I beat. Is it champion Frankie Pace or challenger Al Lubell? The judges give champion Frankie Pace two and three quarter stars. Al Lubell receives three and a half stars. We have a new champion. Congratulations, Al. You did a very good job. Tell me, you're an attorney. Are you still practicing law? No, I practiced law for two years in Newport Beach, and I quit to become a comedian. Well, you're on your way. We'll see you next week. Congratulations, Al. Thank you. Then in the semifinal, I, I know I lost to... I had already won three or four of them, so I already qualified for the semifinals. But I lost... The way I got... I lost to Michael Finney. Do you know my comedy magician Michael Finney? Sounds familiar. You know why your dad always hit you with the belt? Because that's all you ever bought him for his birthday, Christmas, and Father's Day was another belt. But then I qualified for the semis. I beat a guy named Ron Richards. I don't know if I think that was his name. A from very funny guy. And the finals, he probably Mike Dugan. Yeah, yeah, Mike Dugan. I, I remember him too. Yeah, great com and yeah. also a great writer. So he's uh, writes on TV shows and a really funny guy. So yeah, I got very lucky uh, doing that. You know. No, that was great. You you were definitely great, very, definitely memorable on that show. Definitely earned it and, and deserved the win and all that stuff. And um, it was just such a great time period uh, for comedy too, like the eighties boom. The, uh, so many great comedians came out of the eighties boom. Um, you know, th there was just so many, uh, so much happening for comedy at that point. All the comedy clubs opening up. I, I, how important would you say the 80s was to stand up? Well, I think it was extremely important, but you could argue it was uh, important in a positive and a negative way. I mean, it was important getting it out there, but I believe like evening at the improv, it, I think that that started late 80s, right? Mid to, well, I actually started early 80s on a small level and it kept getting more and more popular. I didn't start doing it until the late 80s, but uh I think that hurt comedy for a while. I got comedy became on television so much. It was on the A and E network that people didn't feel the need to go out to comedy clubs as much anymore. They could watch it on TV. Yeah. So I think that may have hurt the club world for a while. Uh, but then the club world rebounded. I mean, it got comedy out there. There's a part I have mixed feelings about the whole thing. I mean, there's a part of me that misses. Like I came around, like you said, in the '80s. I wasn't around in the '70s when. Uh, I think actually in the late 60s, the improv, late 60s, the improv opened in New York. And the first time I ever went to the improv, I was uh, a college student. It was like 77, 78. I remember I watched Joe Piscopo come up on stage. And that's cool. Uh, I can't remember the names of a couple of other guys, but uh, it was exciting to see that. And I got the, I didn't, I think back then it was more of a free, you didn't have to kill all the time. It really was the improvisation 
uh, part of it was improv improvisation. You'd have like Broadway, like Bette Midler might show up. I don't know if her literally, but someone like that. And she could sing a song, but improvise something funny, you know, like it didn't have to be this tight business-like thing, like get laughs constantly. And uh, it wasn't as much of a business. It was more of an art form. Right. It, yeah. And I think that's the way comedy should be. And it became a business. I remember when I did the San Francisco International Comedy Competition, and I don't want to knock them. It's a fine, it was a good experience for me to do it, but it was the first time I ever got heard someone say, I think one of the guys, uh, not the guy that runs the whole thing, but one of the guys involved with it said, laughs per minute. Right. <laughs> I never heard that one before. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of a lot of science has been applied to comedy where people say, oh, you need, you know, at least, you know, uh, two laughs per minute or three laughs per minute. And, you know, all this, the setup punch, um, you know, tag type style of comedy, which which definitely was part of like that 80s. And then I think you kind of uh you know, and, you, and they talk about it in the documentary too, that where you kind of forefronted in a way alternative comedy. Now, alternative comedy existed still the way I see it, like, you know, Andy Kaufman and, and the like, but you were still one against the green in, in a different way. I always just wonder like what, you know, especially after watching the documentary, why did you decide, you know what, I, I'm, I know that I'm, you know, winning contests like Star Search and all this with this, comedy i'm currently doing but now i'm going to take it into and do it this way but the truth is you can go just like that have you heard that before you can go just like that that's not that's not a second ah. that's a fraction of a second right ah. this is a second ah. <laughs> right? so not only can i die now or now or now i can die now 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 I can't answer simple questions. Hey, Al, got a second? I don't know. Yeah, it wasn't a conscious decision uh, to ch try to change the way I was doing it. It was like, I didn't like, uh, I just wanted to express myself. And it turned out my expression of myself, I was in therapy. I started going to therapy again in the, in the late 80s. Because actually, yeah, when I won Star Surge, I thought I'd be happy because I won. And I was happy at the moment I won. Right. But three, four days later, I got really depressed. And I've only learned, I recently, recently listened to some podcasts by this, uh, by a psychologist guy that, you know, it's normal to have the big letdown, you know, after a big, you get the big dopamine, dopamine hit, right, getting what you want. But then you the dopamine crashes, you know, and like, there's certain ways to kind of keep the dopamine not crashing. I forgot the details. But anyway, I didn't know this back then. So I got really depressed. I started seeing a shrink. And and via doing that, I started learning about myself a little more, like uh, getting more in touch with the fact that I was angry at my mother, right. how bowling she still was, and uh, and just how fearful I was. I remember his final words to me when I stopped seeing him about like 1992. His final words to me were, press against the fear. Because so I'm going to feel the fear, but you got to press against it, you know, and try to, you know, not always. I mean, sometimes fear is healthy. Right. You know, but in general, like, you know, I'll, you know, mo most people do, a lot of people do this, but I'll always do this. I'll, I'll invent many, many ways to decide to not do something because I'm scared of it. Right. You know? And most of the time you don't need to be, you feel, there's a good book out there called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway. Uh, it's a very good book. And that's essentially she's saying the same thing as press against the fear. Right. But what's my point? My point, oh, so my point is I learn more about myself in therapy. So by via learn, learning more about myself, then I wanted to express that. It just seemed like, you know, so it wasn't a conscious decision. Oh, I'm going to try to be alternative. I didn't think that. I just, right. it turned out I'm kind of a weird guy to begin with. And if I express myself, I'm going to come off alternative. Right, right. And, and I think that, you know, I do think it's it's brave in a way to go up, you know, on, on stage, especially in the beginning when people aren't ready for it, you know, because now if, if someone goes to see you, they know they're getting out of the bell, they, they know who you are, you know, you've established. Actually, let me just interrupt for a second. That's not really true. Like I'd say 90% of the audience still doesn't know me, 95%. They really right. don't. And it's still a, a hat, you know, but I like the challenge kind of, I actually like it. I'm scared. Come If ever, the day ever came where everyone liked me and knew me, that's going to be scary because I don't like, I like a challenge. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you could see that too. Like in, in, in your, 
in a lot of your stuff that I've been, you know, watching throughout the documentary and also, you know, through YouTube and stuff like that, um, you, you could see that you, you like, you kind of thrive off the awkwardness a little bit, and then you, you want to win them over. And, and that's to me, one of the greatest things a comedian can do is when you bring them to you instead of you pandering to them. So you've now brought them into your, your zone and now right. they're, they're, they're on board with you. And I think that says a lot and it's not I easy. I, I like doing that. And there are negatives to that because sometimes you don't, you don't get everybody a lot, you know, sometimes you don't get everybody, you know? And so you lose some people and then you lose work because the club's upset. You didn't get everybody, you know? Right. Right. Yeah. But I don't think comedy should really, well, at least for me, I can't, if I try to really please them with what they, what they want to hear, I just lose my soul. I lose interest. I, I can do it for maybe four minutes. And then I want, you know, I, I want out. You, right, know, right. Want <laughs> <laughs> you would think that being good enough would be enough, but it's not enough. So that whole, like um, a lot of comics, is, you know, normally, oh, I have my, my clean set. I have my dirty set. I have this set. I have the set for, uh, you know, if I play a black crowd, I got my set for a white crowd. You, you for you, it's I'm playing the room as me take it or leave it no I, part of me wishes i could say that it's not really true <laughs> <laughs> uh i can sense how much a crowd can take i still want to uh it depends on the audience like if i if i know it's a real stiff kind of audience i will gently break them into what i'm doing you know because i still want to do well i won't completely sell out i won't do you know like but i'll try to like men uh, manipulate them to try to get them to where I want to go. Right, right. And I know not to try to overdo it up front and lose them. Because if I lose them, what's the point? I mean, I can completely lose them. Then the club won't have me back. And they hate me. The crowd hates me. And I don't feel that was a good experience for anybody, you know? So, and also I do like to manipulate. So I like to try to take a crowd that's not going to go my way initially and not overdo it with them and up front because then I lose them. Right, so try right. To slowly manipulate them, slowly break them down. I like to torture people. <laughs> I think that's awesome. And, and I think, um, you know, some of your stuff, like when you uh, first come out, sometimes you'll sing, you know, just uh, to the people and, and measure the laughter in the room. A little bit of laughs. Oh, no, now we got a little more laughs. Great job, Marty. You did this great job, and you guys are a nice crowd. It's nice to be here tonight at the Borgata Comedy Club. Some of you might be wondering why I'm singing. It's because I like singing. I enjoy singing, but I am a comedian. My job is to get laughs. I hope I'm funny here tonight. Uh oh, I got no laughs right there, though. Well, I got some laughs right there. <laughs> and it goes on, and it's it it actually gets more and more funny as it goes because you know i guess because you keep doing it and you're not stopping and just you know the people are waiting and it's just one of those things that just uh i, I just love that <laughs> and, and when i'm watching you know you do those that stuff i'm also kind of wondering how the crowd is hand you know like i'm, I'm thinking about it's like if I was to introduce you to somebody new, I would be watching their reaction to you, you know? So I that's like a, that. Would you welcome Al Lubell? Al Lubell. Al Lubell. Al Lubell. Yes, my name is Al Lubell. Al Lubell. My name's Al. Al Lubell. 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 You know what's strange? The more I say my name, the more y'all look at me like, who is this guy? <laughs> this this documentary, mentally, Al is is awesome and it's a great look into your into your life into your comedy side your personal life I mean, it gets real personal at times um you know there's nothing sugar-coated or anything um uh, how are you happy with how this came out and, and what's your thoughts on the documentary as a whole now that it's out there for everybody to see on amazon yeah it's uh and also I'll give it a plug on other, uh, the other places too, like YouTube and those other things, you know, uh, I've never been on, what are they called? Apple, iWorld, iTunes, Apple TV, whatever that is. Right. I've been on that stuff. Anyway, I'm on it actually, but never as a human being, you know, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, 
But uh, my point is that, uh, yeah, I was really pleasantly surprised that the guy, the director had seen me in uh, high school. He was in high school and I played the New York Comedy Club, you know, actually in Boca Raton. Oh, you know, wow. Okay. New York Club in Boca Raton. Yeah, uh, cool. Florida. And ironically, in, uh, in New York City, there's a comedy club called the Boca Raton Comedy Club. I'm joking. <laughs> but uh no but my point is that uh he had seen me in high school and always liked me he'd come to couple two three times to come see me along with the producer of it uh dana marino and i think the cinematographer and co-producer also uh jordan service anyway so uh anyway he asked to do a documentary on me when he was in high school and I didn't want him to do it because I was working on a screenplay about me, which I'm still working on, actually. <laughs> but this is back in 2004. I, uh, I didn't want it to interfere with my screen. I thought it would make like over, like, you know, if a documentary about me is already out, then no one's going to want to see the screenplay because the screenplay is already about me, too. You know, I only have one me, you know, so. Right, but, right. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm still working on the screen. Anyway, my point is I didn't want him to do it. But then to make a long story short, ran into each other in L in L.A. about six years ago. And uh, he had gone to film school already and he asked me again to do it. And so I agreed. And, uh, and then uh, I was pleasantly, you know, I didn't, you know, I, I liked the fact that he really liked my sense of humor, like, you know, and so I thought that was a good sign, okay. but he had never done a documentary before. He never directed any a documentary. And uh, so I didn't, but I didn't really care almost how it came out. I didn't really think about that. I was just thought like, let him do it. You know, I didn't really want it done anyway. So I really wasn't worried about it because I didn't really want it done. You know? <laughs> His idea was to get me a Netflix special, but to get, they said no, because they didn't know who I was. And uh, so he figured he'll do a documentary. He says, can I just do five minute documentary on you? Just a little something to show them. But of course it slowly started growing to 10 minutes to 15, you know, and then ended up growing to the whole thing. Ironically, he then tries to sell the documentary to Netflix and they still say, we don't know this guy. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> no, we don't know this guy. So, uh, anyway, my point is that I was really pleasantly surprised with what a good job he did. Before there was a word alternative comedy, there was Al. Talking about myself is what makes me different from all the other comedians out there today. Because if you notice, they almost never talk about it. <laughs> he told me what he did. He's kind of meditated on it. He had all this film shot on me. And I believe he said to me, I just meditated on it. I just thought like, what would naturally follow to this? What would naturally follow to that? And uh, I've seen it a couple of times with an audience, how an audience reacts. And I, they really react well, the two audiences I've seen. And uh, yeah, I'm really, I, last time I saw it was at the Gasparilla Fest, Film Festival in Tampa back in June. No, oh, nice. Yeah, and I was really impressed. Uh, and then I watched it with a couple of friends a few days ago. And I liked watching it again. Uh, because also they added music. Uh, they got a guy that did great background music. Yeah. Or, and that made it flow even better. And I must say, I thought uh, Josh really did a, a great job of directing it. Just concerned about how much of me I can be. Somehow, powers that be didn't pick up on him. Whether I'm right. There's comics, and then there's Albie Bell. My whole life it's been hard to get work as a comedian. And I can really feel that a lot of people like it, and a lot of people with it. I gotta be He's going to do what he wants to do. And you love him, or you don't get it. Yeah, and, and then... Also, with the guy Alex Russick, I should say. Also, Alex is the co-editor. And, and that also incredibly helped and uh yeah it really flows and it's real and i think in one review it's really well said josh doesn't take a point of view about it he's not approving of me he's not disapproving of me he's just showing it and right. i think that's what a documentary should be you know so it's not so much the room it's just you get these when i walked in i was immediately depressing how many older you know tired people these are not my crowd now there could be half the crowd that loves what i'm doing but when you get half the crowd hating you, it's not going to be easy to get booked back. And like you said, he didn't take a point of view, and it really, it really exposes you as a person. Was there anything off limits, or you just let him have this full, um, you know, 
uh, control of you know of everything he shot. Yeah, I don't. I didn't really. I didn't say anything was off limits. Yeah, because you know, um, it, I, I loved it, and I think it it gets really uh, you know deep. And and your mom, uh, God bless her. I'm sorry uh, her, on her passing and all that since the Thank the you. taping. The, um, that must have been been a tough for you because I, I think you had like a bittersweet uh, relationship with her. Yeah, I did. It, it was very tough. But the weird thing is I feel kind of bad. The one part I feel bad about is where I'm like angry at her, like in the car ride heading to visit her. She fucked it up. If there was parenting class, she would have failed. She would have failed parenting class. It should be parenting class, but she would have failed. And is it a surprise I'm a failure? I'm the product of her. So I'm a failure because I was raised by a person that would fail parenting class. But it's true about me. I would get angry like that in life. I think that. But the bottom line is, you know, I really did love my mother almost too much. I was too attached, but which I'm angry about actually, because I was too much of an attachment, but, you know, wildly attached to my mother and like her being the most special person in my life, you know? So, uh, but I feel bad. I showed that side of me, but I think a documentary should show that. She always said, you're nothing but a spoiled brat. But I was thinking, you know, if my mother didn't give in to me, I could never become a brat, right? You can't become a brat. If your parent doesn't give in to you. So my mother is yelling at me for being something that she created. I mean, that's, that's like walking up to somebody, stabbing them in the chest and going, you're such a victim. Yeah, I think we all feel that way about our loved ones and people close to us and, and uh, you know, especially our parents. And a lot of times when things don't go your way, you know, it's, it's easy, I guess, to blame them. It's your, your right. fault. You, the way you raised me, man, you know, and right. uh, you, you definitely played that card. <laughs> <laughs> they were never abusive. They no, were you just... told me they wouldn't let me lift anything. That's abusive. But to you, that's abusive. But they were always there. Yeah, but, That's you, but you also made it that way. How? Because you were very demanding. I thought you I want food now. Right. Not waiting. I want it. And they would run and get it. Yeah. No, I definitely played that. But I also liked what I really, I didn't expect to like this or even, I didn't know how he was. I knew he was filming us talking. But until I saw the documentary, I really loved seeing those moments between me and my mother, like uh, from a third party objective thing, watching it seeing the interplay you know that's how i, I knew like watching that as a viewer and the guy who doesn't know you i i could tell that you had a, a deep love for your mom when you guys were interacting and talking and just the way you would laugh how she would make you laugh and how you guys were on the same page like okay. you tell stories and you just see it both clicks and you both know where you're going with it and and it was it was beautiful we uh, laugh a lot our memories, you know, we remember a lot. And for, if we, we get along, I think, very well. What do you mean the story of your life? Well, because uh, we were very close, weren't we? Yeah, there, there was times in those conversations, you throw like little digs at her and some would go over her head, but other ones you just see her kind of go, hmm. like she would make a face like yep. you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> That's funny. I'll have to watch that again because I didn't even notice that. I'll that I could be wrong. I mean, no, I but, yeah, that's how I, I that's how I read it. But uh, no, you know why? Because I'm so self obsessed a lot. I'm watching myself and not him. <laughs> uh, no, but it was it was uh, like I said, it was very telling, and, and um, you, you know, also the 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 kind of uh, trials and tribulations of uh, of you as as an artist as a comedian. Um, who, who, you know, peaked right out of the gate in the eighties with the big, you know, the star search. And then, um, you know, and then I, I guess it would be tough to see some peers that, that looked up to you move, go on. And I think one of the telling things in the documentary that actually, cause it's the same thing for me, man, I've had, you know, interns and stuff all become way more successful than me. But I, I love the line that actually uh, I felt it because I feel the same way when somebody says that when you got offended because somebody asked you, um, if you if you could do it all over again, would you? And you're like, well, would you ask Jerry Seinfeld that? Would right. you, ask, you know, <laughs> you're like by the fact that you're in saying that to me is insinuating that I failed somehow. And um, 
I, I just, I, I felt it with you and I completely understand what you, what you were saying in there, you know? So like, wh what do you think about like that sort of stuff? I wasn't ready. Like I, yeah, I won star search, but you could say I really wasn't ready to really win. I wasn't an adult yet. I was 31, but I wasn't an adult. I, I, and also I didn't have the kind of material I was doing was, you know, uh, it was okay, but I feel I slowly grew as a person and as a comedian, you know, cause you can't really grow that much as a comedian unless you're a person too. Right. I can only grow so much cause I wasn't really that much of a person yet. Uh, and like, I remember one comedian, a very funny guy named Tim Jones, I think sadly he passed on. And if I'm wrong, please, Tim Jones, don't get mad at me for saying this, but <laughs> I heard this, but a very funny guy. I remember he once said to me when I was first starting out at the Laugh Stop in Newport Beach, I was hosting shows in the eighties and he was already a, a middle act. He'd come into town, but we were talking. He said to me, it takes about seven years for a comedian to really find himself. And at that point I only been doing it two, three years, but. After seven years, I hadn't found myself. I mean, it took me years and years and still, I think. But I kept going, my friend of mine named Dan said, he was watching, he'd quit stand up. We started together, but I, he let me stay at his house in New York. And he'd say to me, Al, you're one of these guys that just keeps slowly getting a little better, you know? And it was like that through me, through the 90s, just slowly a little better. In the 2000s, slowly a little better. Now, even now, slowly a little better. Going to England and Edinburgh, fig slowly a little better i've always been one of those guys so it doesn't offend me to hear someone say that you know uh because i never was at my peak you know i think i'm getting there now still actually gary shamling once said that to me i used to luckily play basketball at his house and i said gary when did you know you really became gary shamling and he said to me i still don't think i've become it so even right. a guy that brilliant and that with the, with Larry Sanders show, he had just finished the Larry Sanders show. Even he didn't feel he had arrived. So I think maybe it's just an attitude, a mental attitude. Maybe everyone should have, because we're all growing and changing. So yeah, there's a part of me. Totally, I felt jealous of other comics that were passing me by. On, but if I looked at it like passing me by, what does that mean? I mean, Jerry Seinfeld once said a great thing: "You're not competing against anyone." Your, right. your own battle with yourself. And also, what will happen sometimes if you start to do well, you'll re over relax and you'll start screwing up, screwing with lines that you've got down cold. You start going, maybe I'll try it this way right, for the first time in my life. Uh -huh. When it's worked this way every single time, let's try it like that. Would you suggest my shrink said he would offer me Enderol or something? There's some kind of drug that it doesn't alter your mind, but it makes you stop shaking or something. Would you think? I'd yeah, that's good. Do you think that would sure. be Sure. Experiment with chemicals. <laughs> that seems like a very good idea. The higher me could look at it like, you know, me getting mad at that comic saying to me, yes, the, the, the more insecure me got mad. But the higher me should be like, hey, you know, I'm still I'm on, I'm on my own journey. Yeah. Right. And, and, and you are continuously getting better. You're always evolving. Do, do you? By the way, let me quickly say there are some days I've gotten worse. <laughs> like I make <laughs> stupid mistakes and I'm worse than I was and I regress. So it's not like this constant up, you know, I do get worse a lot of times. Yeah. But it's always a chart that's always going up. So right. if, if it, Hope, you know, hope, hopefully yeah. I'm sure it's going to start going permanently down pretty soon. I mean, I don't know how <laughs> soon, but if I keep doing this into my nineties, believe me, it's going down. Right. right. No, but I, I think too, now, like with, with the documentary, you get a whole new audience that's going to now discover you. And, and do you think that the, the documentary could help kind of um, launch you into the public eye more? I'm sure a little, but the question is, uh, you know, I, Dana said a funny thing. I don't know if uh, one of the producers, Dana Marina, right. said to, he said, Al, you know, I don't know if he wants me saying this, but it was funny. He said something like, boy, Al, I don't know. We took on a big job making Al Lubell famous. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> that ain't easy. You know, that ain't easy. I tried, you know, for up, because I've always been ambivalent about fame because the child in me, didn't really want to be famous because I didn't really want to grow up. And right. I associate fame with growing up. I mean, if I become famous, you almost, I mean, to a certain extent, you have to grow up to a certain extent, you know? Uh, and I didn't really want, I wanted to stay a child in the background. I wanted to be in the background, 
you know uh, why do you so think I, though why do you think what, what's afraid of growing up is it the responsibility or or is it that you would have to be on your a game all the time like if you're let's say you're as famous as like or regarded in comedy as like a seinfeld or Chappelle or something like that so now every time you do an appearance you got to be is, is that what it is is that you, you the, the the standard raises part it part of it's that but it's also related to my fear like you know let's say i become a seinfeld or a Chappelle, then i'm a legend what's the next stage after legend dead legend right <laughs> you know it's like uh not just career just dead i, I don't want to grow up because i don't want to die i yeah. keep thinking if i don't have to grow if I don't hit, it's like a joke I sometimes do. Man, if I don't have to hit adulthood, what's after adulthood? Deadhood. Right. If I never hit adulthood, if I stay into childhood, I still got adulthood coming up. My adulthood separates me from deadhood. But if I go to adulthood, then the next stage is deadhood. I'm afraid of death. I'm trying to ward off death. I was always afraid of people dying all the time. Her dying, the father dying. And I think the reason was because I felt so helpless. You guys raised me in a helpless, I was so dependent, wildly. I felt no sense of self. If you guys are dead, I'm dead. And I realize that's stupid because if I become big and famous, I have all this money to buy the anti-aging medicine. <laughs> but uh, no, but you're right. That That is one of my motivations actually to get money, to get famous, to get the money for the anti-aging stuff to ward off death. <laughs> yeah, I think like with with death, it's, it's definitely a scary uh, thought and topic. And, um, you know, is there an afterlife and what really happens or is it just it, it was just over is you know that's the scary part it's the unknown right the unknown i never liked the unknown <laughs> now you, you talk there's a lot of talk about being ambitious uh, throughout the the documentary um you say some parts you say you, you have you are ambitious other parts you say you know i lack a little ambition I, i'm lazy and this stuff now with with this um documentary kind of being a hit and, and and taking off a little bit does that put some more you know uh, stoke some some fire under you do you feel more ambitious do you feel like you want to get to the to a next level or i kind of do but i want it to be i want to kind of be like i just want to keep getting better i like i like getting better i'm fascinated by stand-up comedy like the I, i've noticed ways to keep getting make it a little a better writing better performing of it, better timing, you know, and, uh, and I do, I do kind of like the attention from getting better. Yeah, you know? I must say that, but I don't want to just get well known, you know, I, I like, you know, the idea of getting better at it, because like, like you said, then there's more expected of you. And I'm kind of glad that I am better, because if there is more expected of me now, I feel I'm better and I have something to offer. But right. if I didn't have that, I'd be terrified of getting more attention because, like, I wouldn't feel I had anything to offer. Right. right. So a good thing for me was living in England. I lived in England for like uh, four years, and uh, well, off and on since 2013, kind of like. But uh, but uh, the state, I got more stage time there. I wasn't getting enough in LA, not even enough. I was getting hardly anything, and uh, so I was getting more in England. Again, it was still a struggle there, but I was getting more. So I got a little better out there, you know, so I'm, I'm grateful I got better, you know. And I can see the England audience is really digging you like the English audience is kind of like that kind of alt style. And I, I think that that uh, they must have been eating it up. Oh, thank you. Yeah. But again, every crowd's different. Like you could go to like certain areas in England, you know, where they just expect, you know, where's the joke. Right. right. But in general, I do find. Yeah, English crowds have a, I think maybe English people, they have a better attention span in some ways. They, they're more patient. They'll let you, uh, you know, go a longer way out getting to a punchline if and see where it leads, you know, uh, in some ways. But every crowd is different, you know, like, you know, you, you can get the a great American crowd and a lousy English crowd. You never know. But in general, I, I but for me, I think it woke, it kind of woke me up a little. I liked playing to different audiences out in England and also around Europe just the experience of playing at different type crowds. Because when in America, you know, I get kind of used to the crowds, although I haven't been to a lot of states in America. So that would have been different for me if I had. But the point is going to all these different places, the Netherlands, Brussels, Germany, you know, all these different places and all these different crowds, 
it was helpful for me, a guy who had been doing stand-up for so long, to experience all these different crowds, but also all these different cultures, just to try to wake me up a little, you know, right. like get me out of my habits and you know, I was getting, you know, less depression because you can't be depressed when you're like, wow, what's this? What's that? You know? If you want to be a comedian, someone said it well recently, you know, LA is not the place to be a comedian. It's a place to try to become a star. And I'm kind of ambivalent about that, or I, at least I'm lazy enough that I don't want to do all the work that it takes to become famous. And just fame for fame's sake is bullshit to me. I'd like to keep getting better as a comedian. I don't care. I really don't care about, as a kid, I cared about fame, but I don't care about fame. I, I should maybe, because, you know, having some money is a great thing and takes a lot of stress off. But again, I'm not that disciplined to work hard enough to achieve that. But in England, at least, I could keep getting better as a comedian. And I feel good about that. If there's one uh, takeaway that you want people to have from, from seeing your documentary, what what is it what would you want people to remember about it i think that there shouldn't be just one takeaway <laughs> why uh, it's too much pressure <laughs> pick one takeaway i can't even think of well i can't even think of two takeaways so i mean so that's i don't know if i could think of one of many because i don't know if i could think of many takeaways so i'm afraid to say one takeaway because maybe i should have thought of five takeaways and then pick which of the five takeaways would be the one takeaway. I feel scared if I just pick one takeaway, what if I thought of 10 takeaways and that one takeaway wouldn't be the takeaway I took away? You know, so I, I choose to take away. So I'm afraid how many takeaways do I have to ga gather in my brain to select the one takeaway? It's possible just to pick one takeaway and to say, that's the takeaway. Maybe you're right, that would be the takeaway, but it's creating great anxiety in me, this takeaway question. Al, uh, you're awesome, man. I, I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to talk to me. Uh, tell everybody where they could find the documentary, where they could follow you, if, if you have social media and all that good stuff. By the way, let me say one quick thing, and I'm not just complimenting you because I feel guilty for attacking Parlay. <laughs> but when I watched one of your episodes, I think Cheech, Cheech or Chong, which one? Oh, yeah, Chong, Chong Tommy Chong, yeah. Yeah, excellent episode, and... Uh, Thanks. But I'm really impressed with that and not and this too, that you really take your time to listen and you pause and then you think of your question and you really are very in the moment. Oh, and, thanks, uh, man. That means a yeah. lot. Appreciate yeah, that. Thank, yeah, excellent. Awesome. And what was your question? <laughs> Just uh, if you could tell everybody uh, where they could find you, find the, the documentary or follow you on social media, any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, well, I'm not into that. Uh, I think the documentary, like you said, is on Amazon Prime, but it's on a few other things. I'm working on my website. I'm getting my friend to fix it up. It's not really there yet. Uh, uh, they can find me uh, on Earth. <laughs> awesome. Somewhere on Earth. Somewhere, somewhere on Earth. The odds are, I'm guessing. So far, I've been always on Earth. There's a good <laughs> chance you can find me somewhere on Earth. <laughs>